Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the show where we answer your questions. So if you're sitting at home and you have a question, get in the comments with hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and hopefully we can provide some insight for you. On to the questions. First one is from Hunter Johnson and he says, Hi guys, I have a 2008 Iron Horse 6.6 and I'm looking to convert it to a one by. I would like to make it fit a 10 speed, um, it's currently nine, to make it fit a 10 speed block, it's currently nine. Is it true that eight, nine and 10 speed cassettes will fit onto a standard Freer body? So that's his first question. And yeah, it is in Shimano, they all use that, um, that standard spacing. Sometimes Freer bodies do come equipped with a washer, um, like Mavic ones do to help space them out, but largely it's all, um, it all works nicely. Um, and your second question is, um, should you go to a one by drivetrain and or even a one by specific crank? Um, this is something I always champion. I'm always like, yeah, do it. You know, don't worry about it um, because I, I feel it opens up um, a lot of benefits. It's, I feel it's quieter, it's less complicated, it's lighter, there's less, less moving parts, less to maintain. But some people do feel they just don't get the range. Um, I would say sticking with a, that double crank set you've got on there, you could put a 30 tooth or 32 tooth in replacement in the position of the outer ring. And that is gonna give you loads and loads and loads of options in terms of getting up, uphill. Sometimes you might find that you're spinning out on kind of long road descents, but I don't really care about that sort of thing. My bike, I want the gearing to be effective off-road. Some people might disagree, but that's just how I feel. So you do mention you have 83 mil bottom bracket spacing. So that's a downhill standard. Um, that might confuse things slightly, but it shouldn't too much, I don't reckon. I think if you um, just, you've got, you do have those bottom bracket spaces and don't be afraid to experiment with that. Yes, it might put you um, slightly off center in terms of where the crank sits by a mil or two, but um, it would probably put the chain line in a far more efficient place, especially when you're using those bigger gears. So I say, yeah, go for it. Next question we have from Ben Ben Ryder. And he says, I'm thinking of building up a frame, an aggressive hardtail. Now, can I buy a bottom bracket shell and head tubes and stuff like that? Also a budget for, for the 130, 140 mil. So yes, you can just buy that kind of, you know, head tube section or that bottom bracket shell. Um, a company called Paragon um, could be a good bet. Um, and yeah, it just saves, you know, such tight tolerances, it's probably better to outsource that sort of thing. In regards to a fork, um, it depends what you mean by budget. You know, I could, I would probably recommend a fork like the Marzocchi, um, you know, that Z1, which is a fantastic fork on all accounts. Um, but that might not be, that's a budget high-end fork, if you see what I mean, an entry level to the high end. Um, it might not be so much something that you think, oh, that's really cheap. Something that comes in at slightly lower would be something like the SR Suntour. Um, maybe the all one, which actually is a, is a really decent fork too. So um, yeah, no, super cool you make on your own frame. Good on you. Um, get those pictures into the GMBN tech show. Oh, she's a bit slippy. Okay, so next question. I'm going to try and answer this one quickly because this damp rock is a, oh. the bottom's going to get cold. So let's try and uh, keep it moving. And it is from H. Schenk, I'm going to think I'm going for. And he says, I'm wondering if it is possible to switch my 2011 Fox 36 Talus 180 mil to a float air spring. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, Talus was um, basically travel adjust, which operated on the left hand side, the air or the spring side of the fork. Um, it might not be possible to find parts, but it'd be really cool to know if it was actually possible or not. Well, the 36 fork is, you know, still very much alive and well and part of um, Fox's lineup. One of the reasons riders maybe weren't so keen to embrace that travel adjust system, and it was the same with RockShox, was it did compromise um, suspension feel. I would think that the inner diameter of um, those tubes hasn't changed. I would think you could probably put a new Evo um, air chamber in there, or an, an, an air spring hole assembly in there, and it not be a problem. Um, they're actually really, really simple to do. We did a real-time service on a RockShox system, but apart from basically it being a um, like retaining spring clip instead of a circlip, it's exactly the same. So 
check out this one to see how we got on and um, the all important, important moment of truth where we pull out that air shaft. So next question from um, Joan, Juin uh, Alconez and he says, hello Doddy and Henry and the GMBN team. My right lever started leaking after I changed my pads. I pushed the pistons back to their original place. Maybe, you, maybe I pushed them too far. The oil is leaking from under uh, where the brake lever is and he has the Shimano BR M315. So if you were to have a hydraulic system that basically has the correct, the, the factory amount of oil in, if you see what I mean, the, pi the pistons should be pretty much flush, maybe a, a little bit further out, but they should be able to house one of those um, brake blocks in there comfortably. Now, sometimes you can get it where the system at some point, for one reason or other, has been overbled. And what that means is that those pistons, when you're pushing them back, well, the system's already at max capacity. There's nowhere for it to go. Um, now, people would overbleed their brakes for a number of reasons. One of the reasons Shimano's are commonly overbled is to compensate for pad wear. Um, this gives a more consistent braking feel. So I would suggest um, just releasing that 2.5 mil bolt that sits in the lever and then just prizing them back. They should be able to go full. If you can track down all those yellow bleed blocks, that would be a nice gauge for you to go by. Um, and then it will be able to release us any excess oil. Just put that bolt back in and you're good to go. Um, it's not sometimes the force, the hydraulic force, when you're really pushing back can mean the oil purges around the, um, the diaphragm of the brake lever, but it's not too much of an issue. You, I doubt you'll have damaged any parts. So um, I hope that solves your problem. Okay, so we have a question from Harrison Griffiths, and he wants to know why companies don't make pre-bedded in rotors. Um, it's because what you're trying to achieve when you bed in a rotor or bed in your brakes is basically forming a beautiful partnership between the pads and the rotor. You want the material from that very pad to deposit upon the braking surface. So if you, in the factory, bedded it in with sintered pads or metallic pads, a resin or organic pad would have a really hard time getting purchased. Um, you know, I don't want you to view bedding in pads as a pain or a big job that's a nightmare, it's actually a really easy way to get your brakes working pop properly. Um, you know, there isn't really a good reason why you'd want pre-bedded in um, rotors. And yeah, it's, uh, it actually works really well as is. The next question is from Christopher Pronger. And he says, if I switch from a 32 tooth chain ring to a 34 tooth one, do I have to remeasure the chain length? Well, um, I wouldn't say re-measure the chain length, but I would certainly suggest checking it. Um, so when you kind of shorten a chain using a, a power link, which I, I assume you will be, although chains do come in those individual links made up of inner plates, outer plates, inner plates, outer plates, the minimum you can shorten a chain is remo removing a set of inner and outer plates. Do you see what I mean? So going from a 32 tooth to a 34 tooth, it would only be the next size along. You couldn't go to a 33 tooth in terms of length. Um, now, what that means is when we want, we want, the way we want to check it is to put it in its configuration that's gonna be under the most amount of tension. So that is in the big ring at the back and on a one by drivetrain, just the one ring at the front. And then we wanna make sure that the suspension can move freely into its stroke. If your chain is too short, it will actually be limiting the, um, the action of the sus suspension. So really easy to do, just disconnect your top shock bolt and just cycle the bike through its, um, through its travel, just to make sure, usually they should be okay. If it was cut properly the first time, then it, it should be okay to have that little bit of slack. Next up, we have a question from Felipe, and he says, hey guys, is it easy to change a spoke if I've got a tubeless setup? Essentially, he's basically had to replace a spoke on his back wheel. He's taken it to his local shop. And although the spoke was relatively cheap, the overall cost of the job was a bit more than he was expecting. When you've got a tubeless system and you're replacing a spoke and you can't just you know, <laughs> leave the nipple in the wheel and unthread it that way, um, you do have to break the seal of the tape. 
and then you've got you know reinstall and set up tubeless which is a bit of an issue with the system um, and my kind of only real frustration with it apart from that i'm pretty easy um, in regards to the job you you discuss the balancing or the truing of the wheel now truing wheels can take a long time especially if your wheel went in there in quite bad shape now you might say well it's not a braking surface i've got the rotor why is tension so important? Well, correct tension is going to ensure that less of your spokes break in the future um, and you have a stronger all round build. It also depends, you know, your style of bike, where you're riding. And sometimes some rims are just are absolutely battered. They've been warped over time. And so then it can become a really difficult job to get a decent combination of trueness and tension. So, you know, I do kind of feel for both of you, obviously you're spending money on your bike that you hadn't anticipated spending and your bike shop, I'm sure, is just trying to do a good job. Um, you say you've, you've then gone on to break more spokes, so I would look at the full wheel build, what's actually happening there. Sometimes when you break spokes, there's a theory that then it passes the stress onto other ones, so replacing one spoke just replaces, just changes where the weakest link is in the whole chain, if you see what I mean. Um, I personally feel that with say like a plain gauge spoke, that's a spoke that's uniform shape from top to bottom. It's very stiff and can be quite brittle. Take that into account if you haven't got, you know, kind of decent rims. And suddenly, if you're riding that sort of bike on aggressive terrain, it can just be going round and round and round and you'll, uh, you'll just be chasing your tail forever. So tensioning is important. Uh, maybe speak to a local bike shop. Most bike shops are actually really reasonable. If you say, you know, really grateful for the work, but perhaps I'm not familiar with why this was carried out or the procedure. I'm sure they'll happily explain. Um, so yeah, best of luck with that one. And there we have it. That's another episode of Ask GMBN Tech. If you're at home with a good question, get in the comments, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, and hopefully we can answer it on the show. If you want to stick with the channel, click down here for my real-time bleed of a Shimano braking system. We discussed some of those points earlier on in the video. And click down here for the tour of how Gore make their jackets with Doddy. Thank you very much. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.